E3 was absolutely huge this year. We got a lot of new announcements, and I'm not going to waste time. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, the top 30 new E3 games. Just a quick disclaimer, Cyberpunk 2077, Fallout 76, Battlefield 5, The Division 2, Last of Us 2, we're not including them on this list because they were announced prior to E3. Number 30 is Dead or Alive 6, the first new entry in the series since 2012's previous mainline Dead or Alive 5. It's been a console generation and we haven't seen one of these, and they're trying to make the jump, perhaps rightfully so, perhaps not, from quote-unquote sexy to quote-unquote badass. Which to be totally fair, makes perfect sense. It is a fighting game, maybe beach volleyball will be the outlet for the sexiness, but they want to try to make the game more brutal, and it certainly is. I think it's going to be an interesting jump, and if they pull it off, I think it's probably a positive step for the series, but it's definitely going to have to be a really good game to get over certain people's perceptions. Let's hope it is. Number 29 is Gears Tactics, a turn-based strategy game that takes place 12 years before Gears of War calling it their take on a classic turn-based strategy game, saying that the story is character-driven, as well as with faster-than-your-typical turn-based strategy gameplay, tailored to feel more aggressive, and with boss battles that are intended to feel at home in the Gears universe. I think this is actually a pretty good idea. It's something that's fresh for the series, and I don't know how to express this, but Mario vs. Rabbids made me want more kinda simple turn-based strategy games based in other games I like. Number 28, speaking of simple, fun Mario Party games, the main one is back. Super Mario Party seems like possibly one of the most interesting versions of Super Mario Party, period. We have the motion controls with the Joy-Cons to work like the Wii versions of the game, we have more traditional gameplay, and we have the ability to arrange Switch screens differently to play different versions of the same game. They showed an example in a trailer, and it kind of seems like a massively obvious thing that for whatever reason nobody has done before. Now there's a chance this is the only really big innovation in using multiple switches for these games, but it is Nintendo, and for them to just show everything they're gonna do in a trailer seems odd, but the minigame, party game, fun time, weekend time killer is coming later in the year. Number 27 is De Racine, a really big departure for From Software, who typically makes the Soulsborne games. The idea of a game is that you are a spirit summoned by a young girl in a boarding school, and you have to prove your existence to students. Now it is a PSVR game, so the potential for intricate and interesting mechanics is actually fairly high, knowing that From Software is typically a proponent of some type of precision-oriented gameplay. That being said, I don't know exactly what to expect and I'm interested to find out more. Number 26 is Unravel 2, which is unveiled to be a co-op game, still based in the same types of gameplay as the first, but obviously making the puzzles more accessible for two players. Now, it's been said that this game doesn't quite have the emotional punch of the original, but all of the mechanics, level design, and everything else has improved largely over the first, so honestly that sounds pretty good to me. I don't know really what else emotionally there is to mine out of a game with mainly yarn-based platforming mechanics and no dialogue. Certainly there's probably something, but it's really the gameplay itself that I was hoping to see more out of if they ever made a second one of these, and they did. And it's already out too, you can literally get it now, That which is, I, I like that a lot. Number 25 is Twin Mirror, which is, I'm gonna go ahead and say, an intriguing title. It comes from us from the studio who made Vampire and Life is Strange, and is being labeled as a story-driven adventure game. The main character comes back to town for the funeral of a friend, he's also recovering from a bad breakup, and he ends up waking up with no memory of the previous night in a hotel room, finding a bloodstained shirt, and a mystery to unravel. The game appears to have a lot of supernatural elements and or sci-fi elements, we're not really 100% sure about that yet, but apparently the line between truth and deception is blurred. I think it sounds great, it looks great, and I'm looking forward to another story out of them. Number 24 is Sea of Solitude, a very unique looking game that I think presented a fairly underused style of art. And no, I don't mean the cel-shaded cartoony look, I mean the specific art style. It's reminiscent of some various cartoons from about maybe a decade ago, 
or so. The idea is that when humans get too lonely, they turn into monsters, and that's what happened to you as the main character. And you apparently have to reunite with other of the monsters to change back into a regular human. At least that's the explanation we've been given. It is gorgeous. There's so much color. It looks weird and different in a way that I very much want to see how it plays out. Number 23 is Hitman 2, which let's talk about the episodic release of Hitman 1, which eventually came together to be a really good reboot game of the series. Hitman 2, they're foregoing that and releasing it all at once. And from the looks of it, the sandbox elements have been expanded even further. The game is touting the idea of using the world as your weapon and shows the titular Hitman in many different costumes. In many ways, it seems like a return to the glory of the very original Hitman, except for obviously looking a lot better. I'm thinking they've made plenty of money off the episodic release and then the final altogether release of the first Hitman reboot, and they're just wanting to keep that goodwill train rolling. Number 22 is Overcooked 2, the quote-unquote cooking simulation that's very quirky and strange, which kind of plays out as a party game. This new version of it adds a throw button as well as online play, which is great because it seems weird that the original actually didn't have that in the first place. Overcooked is a really fun competitive game. I enjoy the hell out of it, and just for those two improvements alone, I'm ready for the second. Number 21 is The Awesome Adventures of Captain Spirit, which is a free game out from the same people who made Life is Strange that, interestingly enough, will impact your experience in Life is Strange 2. It does take place in the same universe and apparently functions as your quote-unquote first steps into the world of Life is Strange 2. Now, we don't know exactly how the game is going to play out yet. It's starring a young boy who has superpowers, similar to the fact that Life is Strange is essentially that same thing, although this kid leans so much more into the idea of being a superhero from the looks of it. Beyond that, all we know is that the data will carry over into Life is Strange 2, and choices will likely affect that game. I haven't played it yet, but I really intend on doing so. We've been really busy, obviously, and I'm kind of waiting to get into this when I can. Number 20 is Session, a skateboarding video game that attempts to mimic the Skate 4 control scheme that everybody wanted. Skate 4 obviously isn't something that exists, but when Session came out, they were like, this has got the control scheme that is like it with the dual sticks and all, you know. It was actually a game that was kickstarted last year. Apparently it got funded by Microsoft because it is exclusive to the Xbox One as far as consoles go. It'll also be available on Microsoft Windows. Really, we don't get enough skateboarding games nowadays, so having one that adopts the control scheme for one of the better skating games, I'm looking forward to it. Number 19 is Trials Rising. If you're fond of the dirt bike platforming of Trials, it's back. It's one of the few games that so seamlessly integrates platforming with physics puzzles without seeming weird in any way. The concept perfectly marries those two things. And apparently the main draw is simply more tracks than ever before, but there is also a cooperative multiplayer game mode called Tandem Bike. They have some interesting tracks set up, for instance Yellowstone and the Eiffel Tower, as well as in the inclusion of a Trials Track Editor. Not the first time they've included something like that, but it's been pretty dry on the Trials front since 2014, so it's nice to see it again. Number 18 is Just Cause 4, which we don't know a hell of a lot about. We do know that they demonstrated some interesting ideas, specifically in weather. They've added tornadoes, blizzards, sandstorms, and lightning storms with the intent of tripping you up further, as well as more physics-oriented vehicles like wrecking balls. It seems like they're just going to be adding a large set of various things to the idea of Just Cause and also making the graphics a lot better. Not that Just Cause 3 looks bad or anything, but this looks... I mean, this looks good. We don't have a lot of details. We've just seen a trailer, but it really looks like there's a lot of ground that's going to be covered, and that's exactly what we want out of Just Cause 4. Number 17 is Forza Horizon 4, the newest entry in the more environment and car-focused 
less simulation, more fun arcadey racing series of Forza games. It looks gorgeous for one. I mean, Forza always looks gorgeous, but this looks really, really amazing. Every time, I don't know how they actually improve on the graphics because I always go, all right, they hit the limit and they always improve it. This time around, we're getting 450 plus cars and we're also getting cross play between Xbox One and PC, which is very good. Forza Horizon is also bringing seasons that change every week, apparently, and minor things change like hay is mowed down and bailed in the autumn and the sheep get shorn as well, which is, I mean, it's an interesting detail, but that's really what Forza is known for, the incredible detail of the environments that you just whiz right past as if they're nothing. It looks gorgeous, I can't wait. Number 16 is Control, a new time-bending game by the developers of Quantum Break, and oh, it looks like Quantum Break. It does look very much as though the stakes have been raised at the studio, because to me it just seems more vibrant than even Quantum Break, which is frankly a really awesome game. But we don't know if Quantum Break and Control are somehow related. What we do know is that the main character becomes the new director of the quote-unquote Bureau of Control. They're going to be fighting supernatural enemies in the oldest house, and they have a weapon that shifts around on its own, and frankly, it looks cool as hell. Supernatural sci-fi at its best, I will be playing Control. Number 15, Battletoads, is exactly what it sounds like. Some toads that battle. Now, Battletoads is definitely going to be a nostalgia thing for people, let's just say. But I'm excited to introduce this to a new generation of people, because it's been a very long time since Battletoads. Battletoads is a beat-em-up platform side-scroller. It also has levels that contain sort of vehicle-oriented type racing slash stunt-oriented gameplay, and it's tough as hell. It was a game that was meant to be competition to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, both as a franchise and as games. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles also had side-scrolling beat-em-ups that had other elements represented in the gameplay as well. Supposedly, this new Battletoads will have and I'm just quoting straight from the trailer because we haven't seen any of this, body morphing genre mashups, three player couch co-op, 2.5D graphics that are hand-drawn and 4K in resolution. And honestly, the thing I'm obviously most excited for there is the idea that I could have a couple of people over and play some Battletoads. Like I said, this is kind of a nostalgia thing for probably a lot of people, but it could potentially really be big for people who like side-scrolling games, particularly beat-em-ups. And if it's done right, could be a huge reintroduction of, frankly, one of the better franchises in that. There were a few different Battletoads games, including an arcade one that you can play currently if you are resourceful. And if you can, I'd really recommend you do. I hope this brings it back and we get a bunch of Battletoads games. I love Battletoads. Number 14 is Assassin's Creed Odyssey. We have got a lot of interesting stuff on Assassin's Creed Odyssey. First off, there is a female protagonist. You can play it as a man or you can play it as a woman. And to have an Assassin's game set during the Peloponnesian War in Greece seems like a really different idea for Assassin's Creed. Now, Assassin's Creed Origins did a pretty good job of expanding on the gameplay a little bit, although some of the combat felt a little simplified in a way that maybe they'll take feedback on. And I kind of think that Origins is the best Assassin's Creed title in quite a while. So seeing them keep going in this direction, I think is an interesting thing. I'm looking forward to at least trying it. I'm hoping it hooks me like Origins did and I'm looking forward. Number 13 is Doom Eternal, the sequel to Doom. Oh yes, I am happy. I love the Doom reboot, okay? It just worked. They incorporated a lot of sort of score-based elements, modernized it, made it feel a little bit arcadey, but it retained that crazy frenetic feel of Doom from way back in the day. And apparently the intent is to have a quote-unquote stronger protagonist and twice as many demons. And we haven't seen a lot other than a short trailer that didn't really feature any gameplay, but showed us a world that's a lot more grim than the first Doom, which is impressive to say the least. 
and I'm looking forward to Doom being around forever. They're just doing exactly what they should be doing with it. Phenomenal. Number 12 is Starfield, a game that has us thinking it's basically Elder Scrolls or Fallout except in space, which is something that frankly seems like it should work out pretty easily. Now we've not got a lot of details on Starfield. We've seen some visuals, we've heard Todd Howard talk about it. There's been lots of rumors over the years talking about a first person shooter slash RPG hybrid, but apparently they're gonna be talking about this more at QuakeCon. I look forward to that quite a bit because, well, we don't know a lot about it and it could be Skyrim in space. I'll take that. Number 11 is Elder Scrolls Blades, which is really interestingly enough a mobile RPG that looks really good. Like everything about Elder Scrolls Blades looks clever from the way that you slash your sword using taps and slides to the way that you navigate the world either with a traditional stick and buttons or by tapping. You can also play it in both widescreen or portrait mode and although we really don't have much detail on exactly where or how it takes place we do know you'll be inside dungeons and outside in beautiful environments and it will be in the Elder Scrolls universe. We also found out that there will be both handcrafted and procedurally generated dungeons which is a throwback way to the beginning of the original Elder Scrolls arena. To me, that automatically seems interesting, and I like my mobile games. Give me some Elder Scrolls that I haven't played before, and I'll be happy to do it. Number 10 is Wolfenstein Youngblood, which is a co-op Wolfenstein game featuring BJ Blazkowicz's twin daughters shooting up Nazis in the Fourth Reich that's still going on in 1980. Honestly, what we've seen of it is so intense looking. The environments are just caked in red, but we've also got the hints of the sort of neon on 1980s lighting, as well as an obvious sense of destruction that we may not have seen in the 1980s. Now, we don't know a whole lot beyond that, but having Jessica and Zofia Blaskowitz on a mission to save their father who has gone missing in Paris, France, frankly, I couldn't ask for more. I love Wolfenstein. Number nine is Gears of War 5, which will star a character that made her debut in Gears 4, Kate Diaz. Beyond that, we don't know a lot about the story. It will feature original characters. We saw a scene that was kind of working around a cinematic scene that honestly, I think they would have been better off just showing the gameplay because once the gameplay got going, it was like, yes, this is a good looking Gears of War. It's fast paced, it's frenetic. It's certainly got that I'm working to not get over taken by the weird alien species feel to it and that's basically why I'm gonna play a Gears game in the first place so I think odds are that it's going to be at least as good as Gears 4 which some people think is good some people think is not great I enjoyed could it have been better sure but I think that's where we're sitting with Gears 5 I think it will be better this is Coalition's second Gears game aside from remaking the first they will have settled into the franchise and I expect them to probably have developed from their first I'm looking forward to it. Number eight, Devil May Cry 5 is, well, let's just go ahead and say it, something that should have happened a long time ago. But it's not something that was 100% unforeseen. There was some rumblings of it earlier in the year, thanks to social media posts by the director and producer of the game, as well as some of the actors that are involved in the series. But we've seen some pretty interesting stuff involving this game with very high speed, very frenetic. I don't know that we've actually seen 100% real gameplay because most of it seemed pretty cinematic to me. But we did get introduced to a new character who seems refreshingly weird in a good way. And I think Devil May Cry 5 is going to be definitely a worthwhile installment. Number 7, Jedi Fallen Order. As somebody who is extremely worried about the various moves that EA made earlier about the Star Wars games, particularly making it seem as though they didn't really want a linear, story-oriented single-player game, this announcement is a little bit puzzling, but at the same time a lot bit satisfying. Respawn, the people behind Titanfall and Titanfall 2, which by the way is phenomenal, are working on Jedi Fallen Order, which is going to be a single-player story game somehow. It's going to be dark and gritty as well, according to Vince Zampella, one of the devs over at Respawn. It's going to 
to follow the path of a surviving Padawan during the dark times after Revenge of the Sith, where the remaining Jedi are being hunted down. We only know one more concrete detail, and that is that you will wield a lightsaber during the course of the game. The rest of it is kind of up to speculation. Now, being that a Jedi is the main character, the assumption I have is that this is not a first-person shooter, or even a third-person shooter. Or it might be, I don't know. I'm guessing it's going to lean fairly heavily, though, on third-person action. We know that the Titanfall 2 developers are good at that, but again, that is a very shooting-oriented title. Also, let's be frank, the campaign in Titanfall 2 is serviceable. It's nice to have a campaign, and it felt satisfying, it was fun, it was interesting to get some lore, some look into the world of Titanfall, but it will be very interesting to see exactly how much they've developed their storytelling skills since then. This kind of reinvigorated my hope for Star Wars with EA. Not that Battlefront 2 hasn't gotten better, it's just it would be nice if we actually just had a good Star Wars game that didn't try to screw us in some way. Low expectations, but hey, maybe we've turned a corner. Number 6. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is the next new game from Software, and let's just go ahead and say this, it's a lot more colorful than your typical From Software game. Now we do see a lot of the elements of the Dark Souls type gameplay, but we see some stuff that I think is very unpredictable in its inclusion. For instance, I'm particularly excited about this grappling hook mechanic. Now it's not as if grappling hooks have never been in mid-century Japan action games before. In fact, From Software actually owns Tenku, the franchise rights anyhow, and there's been a lot of speculation that Sekiro is actually kind of a reboot or re-inspiration or some kind of revival of that series. You see, the subtitle Shadows Die Twice can be taken as a reference to the Tenku series as several of the characters in it were referred to as Shadows and both of the specific ones that were died twice. Now, if you ask me, it doesn't necessarily mean it is Tenku, but there could very well be some inspiration from Tenku, just as there is inspiration from the Dark Souls games. Although being it is a From Software game, it will probably lean harder on the latter. That said, what we've seen of the combat is significantly faster than Dark Souls. However, I think to the savvy eye, you will notice the more tactical approach, just maybe a little bit more arcade-ish, dare I say it. It kind of looks like a perfect game for my personal tastes. I love Dark Souls, but I also really love arcade hack and slash and this looks a lot like kind of both at once, which obviously has me excited. Now, I don't really care whether or not it's a stealth sequel to Tenku, it looks great. It's from software, they've got a batting average of a thousand, so it's safe to assume this will be good. Number five, Jump Force is wild. I mean, that's just, that's the thing that I could call it if I really just wanted to say one word to this. It's wild. It's a crossover of various Shonen Jump properties from Dragon Ball to Naruto to One Piece and Death Note. It's a fighting game in a press release described by Bandai Namco as a three-on-three -three tag team fighting game. And it seems to take place in New York. Well, it doesn't have to be New York. It could just be some unspecified city. It could be Tokyo. Hell, it could be the dream city in Nights into Dreams. Who knows? It's already totally bananas to combine all these things. So why not? Disclaimer, don't think that means I suspect that Nights into Dreams will be incorporated into this game. It's not going to be incorporated into this game. That was a joke. Just figured it wouldn't hurt to be clear about that. Frankly, the art style is weird for this. It retains the basic style for the characters. However, a much more realistic lighting and the backgrounds are really kind of way more detailed and realistic than we've seen in the past with like Dragon Ball Z fighters where they go entirely for the cartoon style. We're currently aware of a few of the characters confirmed, for instance, Goku, Naruto, Monkey D. Luffy, Dyuk, and Yagami Laito. But we don't know a lot more beyond that. Being that previous crossover games like this have contained lots of characters, it's a fair assumption to make that there will be a lot more announced in the future, and we will be on the edge of our seats until we find out those names and exactly how this game is going to play. Number four, Dying Light 2 
actually has some interesting ideas. Now, the original Dying Light is a game that, let's just frankly say it, is a damn good game. It combined parkour mechanics that wouldn't feel that out of place and Mirror's Edge with a sort of dead island but grimmer sensibility. Also at night, obviously, zombies were much more wild and feral. Dying Light 2 looks to take on that concept and just run with it. First off, the narrative is being written by Chris Avalone, who helped write both Planescape Torment and Star Wars Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, and is actually kind of trying to deliver on that whole your choices really matter thing. Now, I can't tell you how many games I have heard the words your choices really matter in a video game presentation, so forgive me for not being blown away by that, but the presentation they gave actually demonstrated how choices will affect the game, and it is pretty deep in the structure. Overall, Dying Light 2 looks a lot like it's going to take the original's base, which by the way, is a good base. It was a slightly different take on zombie stuff. It added the parkour and emphasized the importance of the day and night cycle. They've got Chris Avalone, who frankly, his work on New Vegas, for instance, is probably some of the best work in the Fallout franchise. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why this could very much be the narrative zombie game. We'll see. I'm interested. I hope you're interested. Because the first is great, and it looks like they figured out what was weak about it, and they're just working really hard to improve it. I think that that is the right approach to take, and I'm going to play it. Number three is Neo 2, which keeping in mind we don't know a lot about yet, as is the custom with a lot of these games. Neo 1 is a great game, and I'm really super excited to see another game out of Team Ninja that combines their kind of Ninja Gaiden gameplay with the ideas that are present in Dark Souls. It's a hack and slash, but it's obviously more strategy oriented to be compared to Dark Souls, and it's set in a dark fantasy version of the year 1600. That's just in case you weren't aware. If you thought the Neo 2 trailer looks good, you need to try out the first game. It's one of those games that I really honestly very much enjoy. It was kind of a worthwhile interpretation of the Dark Souls formula that felt very much like its own game. It obviously owes a lot to From Software series, but it does owe a lot to Ninja Gaiden as well, and it's a great game. I really look forward to the sequel. Number two is The Elder Scrolls VI. Now, all we know about this is that it is in pre-production, so keep that in mind. Anything you hear about The Elder Scrolls VI may or may not be real, but we did see an island, a lot of very cool landscape, that we don't really know if it has anything to do with the game at the moment yet, but it was enough to get me excited. Frankly, the thing that has me most excited, though, is just the fact that we got news on a new Elder Scrolls game. We've been waiting to hear about that for a long time now. And although it's just in pre-production and we'll see it in the next console generation, it's just good to know that they do have things rolling on it. And finally, number one, Halo Infinite is the newest, most new engine of all of the Halo games. I called it new engine because it's being built on a new engine and there's no adjective for that. And I think that's actually pretty cool because the new engine, Slip Space, is actually what the trailer was about, even though it displayed some of our various interesting points, such as exactly what the art style for Master Chief's helmet is going to be, which it is fair to say there's a small difference. And the main thing we know about the game is that it is going to take place after Halo 5, it is going to continue with Master Chief's story, and they didn't drop the payload yet. We don't know exactly what that means, and I think that that's probably good. The way they worded that, I'm not really concerned about the alternating protagonist approach they took in Halo 5, and there is a rumor that the single player experience for Halo Infinite is going to hit at the end of 2019, whereas the multiplayer experience will be coming in 2020. That is purely a rumor, take it with a grain of salt, but I also don't know that I would consider that a bad thing if they actually spend the extra time ensuring the multiplayer is going to be not just more multiplayer, but an actual upgrade. We don't know that that's the case, it could simply just be released as one single combo of campaign and multiplayer like a lot of games still are, but I think the approach they took in unveiling Halo in sort of an actual engine reveal was the right way to go. It generated a lot of hype without giving us everything, and we've gotten everything too many times at this point, especially with Halo. I'm interested, and I want to see where it goes. So that's the complete list. It's big, 
it's great. We have got a great couple years ahead of us in gaming. I'm excited. I hope you are as well. Leave us a comment with what you are most excited about, what you're most interested in. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week, and the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. We thank you so much for sticking with Game Ranks for E3. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.